This is my milling machine, and it's in need of urgent and serious maintenance. I should have done this sooner, but full disclosure here, I haven't had the balls. Until today. <clears throat> Let's take a step back and explain exactly what's going on here and what I'm about to try. This is a CNC milling machine. The CNC part of what I just said means a computer runs the show here. And this computer makes these motors turn, which move the ball screws. Ball screws are a novel way of converting rotation from the motor, because that's all these motors can do is rotate, into linear motion. So the table of the machine, for example, is made to move left and right instead of rotate, which would make milling parts a little more challenging. The ball screw assembly is made up of the ball screw and the ball nut. Think of ball screws like Google Translate that change some amount of rotation to straight or linear motion. This particular mill has three axes, X, Y, and Z. Consequently, it has three motors. And one screw for each motor means three ball screws. I'm going to show you something that, I'll be honest, might not be the most pleasant thing to see on a milling machine, CNC or otherwise. If you don't have a strong stomach, you might want to look away now. The Y-axis on this machine has developed about 10 thousandths of an inch of wear. Backlash. Although not necessarily the end of the world for a manual milling machine, it's absolute murder on a CNC. This backlash means parts don't come out the right size, or maybe even the right shape. Here's the Y-axis motor and ball screw. As is, when the computer commands this thing to move, say, 20, I'm making up numbers here. The machine is not going to move 20. It's going to move 10. It'll think it moved 20 because the motor turned enough times to make the ball screw move 20, but the screw lost 10 in backlash. So the net effect is a move of 10. By the way, that ball nut right there is the one we're going to try to rebuild. Wear, or backlash, can also, and often, break tooling. In fact, on manual mills, taking climb cuts on a machine with a lot of wear will snap your end mills. That's important, obviously, but I'm hesitant to mention that given how recently we talked about breaking tooling and blaming that all on collets. I should mention that in that particular case, backlash wasn't breaking the tools. The tools I was breaking were so small and the cuts so light, they didn't have the cut load to move the y-axis on this size of machine. There would still be issues, of course, with positional accuracy, but for the size of cut we were talking about in the collet video, a jump in position due to the backlash would have been improbable. But it's certainly an issue on larger cuts with larger cutting loads, which is why we're even talking about this today. Let's take this nut off this ball screw and we'll talk about what's going on. Some might recall I've gone through some growing pains with this y-axis. Those problems initially were due to miscalculation on my part. Put in a ball screw that was too long for the travel. Basically, when it went full forward, it would crash against the cast iron column and self-destruct. I fixed that, but then messed with my soft limits and crashed it again. The wear we'll be talking about today, I think, is something different. A combination of two things, probably. First, these are really poopy quality ball screws. And second, because the Y-axis is the lightest axis on this machine, I can run it really fast. I've been zipping it back and forth pretty fast. Unfortunately, cheap import ball screws and very high accelerations don't exactly go hand in hand. If I did this right, I should just be able to pull the motor and the screw out of the machine. Before I take this nut off, I'm just going to make note of where it is along the screw. 11 and 11 sixteenths. Well, pretty much spot on. That's not super important, but once I reinstall it, I want to put it in the same place. I'm not going to move the y-axis of the machine. It saves me a lot of fine-tuning after the fact. Normally I'd write that down, but I've got it on video. Now for regular everyday folk like you and me, no offense, removing a ball nut from a ball screw is probably one of the most terrifying experiences you might ever live through. If you live through it. Now, if we weren't going to rebuild this, you'd unscrew this onto some sort of a support. Hold on a minute. Here's a little plastic tube these ball nuts usually ship with. They're the minor diameter of the screw. I guess I might as well. If the stars align, 
and you manage to unscrew it onto this mandrel, you won't lose all the three million ball bearings that are inside of this thing. Yeah, well, where'd you look at that? Let's head over to the bed. If you buy a new ball nut, it'll show up looking something like this, except probably zip tied to a plastic or cardboard tube holding all the balls in place. To install it, you'd do exactly what I just did to remove it, but in reverse. But the tube up against the screw, hold it there firmly, and turn the nut on carefully. In practice, especially with cheap screws like mine, the odds of that going well are sometimes slim. Either it goes on super easy, which isn't a great sign, probably means the nut is loose, or you'll start fighting it, lose your temper, and the balls will go everywhere. Consequently, and unfortunately perhaps, I've had quite a bit of practice reloading these things. Which reminds me, and I should have said this earlier, I'm gonna be replacing the factory balls in this nut with balls of a different size. I got these from McMaster. But the odds of what I'm about to do actually working, I think they're probably pretty slim. More than likely, after this attempt, I'll probably be replacing the entire ball screw assembly. But this little exercise is cheap, maybe even a little fun, and who knows, maybe I'll get lucky. But to make sense of all of that, let's talk about how a ball screw works for a minute. Big picture, they work just like regular nut and screw, except in the case of a ball screw, the nut body never really touches the screw body. Like there are no screw lands that the nut rides on. Instead, there are balls in there that serve as an intermediary. The nut rides on the balls and the balls ride on the screw, just like a ball roller bearing. There's an inside race, an outside race, and never the twain shall meet because there are steel balls in there. Or there were until you broke. When a ball nut is installed on a ball screw, the bearings are trapped inside. The balls are trapped inside. They're forced to recirculate inside of the nut. Let's take this ball here as an example. It works its way around the screw and when it gets to the end of the nut, instead of falling out, it's diverted up and out and back to the beginning where it's reintroduced into the screw helix. They go round and round, but are always trapped in the nut until you accidentally take the nut off the screw. It's usually at this point where your heart sinks into your stomach. Ball screws can and often do have multiple circuits or returns. In this image, for example, there are two ball circuits, each one independent of the other. The balls on the right stay inside their circuit, balls on the left stay in theirs. More circuits usually means a longer nut, but higher load capacity of the screw. Now, speaking of load capacity, let's think about those balls moving around the screw and recirculating through the nut. Let's fix the nut, like bolting it to a machine, and put a load on the screw. In an inexpensive import screw like the one I have, how many of those balls in there do you think are simultaneously contacting both the nut and the screw and carrying that full load? I'd guess three or four, maybe two, but it's probably just one. Full load on the not all those balls means those balls aren't having a great time in there. Over time, the balls are no longer round and they're probably worn out. Of course, the screw could wear too, as could the inside of the ball nut. But these screws, cheap as they are, are rolled. These threads aren't cut or ground into them. They're sort of pushed and smushed and formed. That rolling results in a crazy hard screw, or the screw surface anyway. Even this one, cheap as it is, was a bear to turn the features I needed onto the ends, the bearing supports and the threads for the nut, everything that holds this in place, until I got under that hardened skin. That leaves the nut and the balls. Between the two, as we saw on the indicator, I've picked up about 10 thousandths of an inch of wear or slop. I've now got sloppy nut and balls. <clears throat> I really should just change this entire screw assembly out. But as I said, what I'd like to try instead is install some oversized balls. Earlier when I said this probably won't work, well, the odds of the balls I bought fitting onto the screw without binding everything is pretty slim. Ideally, I'd have a selection of balls of different diameters and I could try them. But McMaster, much to my surprise, only had one size. One size that could potentially work here. These are about, I don't know if you can read that, four thou oversize. Four thousandths of an inch larger than these. If we very simply assume that it'll take up four thou on each side, that should remove eight thou of the backlash that we measured. If they only take up one side, I'll have six thou. Of course, because they're bigger, they're also gonna take up some minor diameter. They're gonna make the inside of the ball nut, well, eight thousandths tighter so it might not even go onto the screw. I've moved myself into a little baking sheet, like a cookie sheet. I'm just gonna finish breaking this thing down. There are some, I guess, dust seals for lack of a better. 
one of the two ball returns already fell out. There's the other one. This nut looks like it's set up to take three circuits, one, two, and three, though it only came with two. I don't have another one of these ball returns, though I'm not 100% convinced those are complete circuits in there. Anyway, give me just a minute. I'm going to throw this in the ultrasonic cleaner, give it a bit of a bath, get the other bearing balls out of here, just generally clean up and get ready for the rebuild. I realize the odds of you being able to see what's going on are pretty slim, but I'll try to walk you through this. First thing I'm going to install is one of these deflectors, and they just pop in from the inside, something like that. Now I'm just going to try to fill that one circuit with the help of two things, some grease and the little mandrel. Some people do this with the actual ball screw, I think, but I'm just going to hold that in there, sort of drop the balls into that groove and try to keep them from falling out. Now there's one thing to be careful of, be aware of. So when they cut this ball nut, they cut it just like any other internal thread, I assume. They cut the whole helix down the body, and then they sort of cut that helix up into sections that will be the circuits for the ball nut. So one, two, three. Between this cut and this cut, so this is the first circuit, goes around one time, balls pop up, move over, and fall back into that same circuit. Same thing with this one. Between this one and this one, there's a bit of thread, like a groove on the inside that is just dead space now. You want to be careful not to load the little bearing balls into that section of the track. Hopefully that's not too confusing. If you end up trying this yourself, it, you can sort of see what's going on in there. There's some dead space you don't want to get the balls into. But otherwise now it's just going to be a bunch of cussing and hoping everything doesn't fall apart on me. Up to a certain point, it's pretty easy, but when you start to get almost like a full turn, you, then you're wrapping across the top and you've got gravity fighting against you. Unless you've got some really sticky grease, I guess. Now, there still might be space for one more. No, nope, that's all that fits. I should have counted how many of those were. It sure looks like another one would have fit. I guess that fourth out adds up. Can you see the balls recirculating in there? All right, I'm gonna to try to do that same exact thing somewhere back here and hope I don't mess up that first circuit that I just built. You'll want to fight the urge to stick your finger in there to try to fix some of those. Because although they don't stick that great to the steel, they'll all stick awesome to your finger. And you'll pull out all the hard work you just did. All right, I can't believe we actually did that in essentially one take. You know what this means though now, don't you? I bet this won't fit on that. All right, it's the moment of truth. I got the shields or whatever they're called back in there. It feels pretty all right on this little spacer tube. That's nothing to go by, but here goes nothing. Ah, uh, it's jamming up. It doesn't want to take, it keeps canting the nut over pretty hard. Uh, well, I'm sorry that didn't work out. I know Hollywood has conditioned us to expect a happy ending in all our machine shop movies. I bought a new one. This is a BXV or BVX or GBH or something. I'll put something up on the screen. 50 bucks maybe, nothing special. Twice as much as one of these, but it might just be markup. No relation to this company, just found them on Google. It's sold as a 2005-3, which technically means it has three returns. 
There's no good way for me to check that. I mean, I could pull the tube out and look, but we all know what would happen then. Mixing and matching these low-cost ball screws can be a bit of a gamble. I could really use a hand here. Those plastic dust seals are always a pain in the butt. It's climbing on there. Feels a bit crunchy. I'm just going to have a peek in the back here, make sure I haven't lost any of those balls. All right. Doesn't feel super awesome, but I really won't be able to load it up until we get it onto the machine. Not really a lot to grab onto and give it the taste test. That should have seated itself in there. I don't think I moved the machine head. Did I get this measurement wrong? I should have wrote it down. A little bit of Loctite on these things wouldn't be the worst idea. And this is the homemade oil line adapter. This is insane that you can sort of even see in there, given that in real life I can barely make it out myself. We're filming through a porthole in the side of the machine. Not that big either. The mark you see there on the inside of the casting is where this screw has crashed before. And I'm using just some bent aluminum TIG filler as sort of a feeler gauge because I have no stereo vision squinting with just one eye through this porthole. If I don't set this right, it'll make for a bad day. If I set it shy, I lose travel. And if I set it proud, well, I lose another ball nut. So I'm between the screw and the casting here. Okay, I think I'm going to stop right there. Let me check what the display says. I'm about three eighths of an inch off, 10 millimeters. I knew I shouldn't have snugged up that ball nut. That screw on the inside is right about here. The inside of the casting we saw earlier with the marks, the crash marks behind it is right here. Maybe I should just drill a hole in this so the screw can never crash. Anyway, let's give it the old shove test. I've got the mill fired up. The computer still turns on, which can only mean we didn't cross thread the ball nut. And now I want to be really careful not to run that thing off the screw. It sounds a little different, if you'll believe that. Maybe it's still a little dry. I did cycle the oiler a few times, filled up this line, but maybe it still hasn't made it in there. All right, I think we've settled it in. Let's see what the indicator says. Uh, I'm just kidding. Inappropriately pulling your leg. This new ball nut is rock solid. I haven't had lunch yet, but I'm willing to bet I could push this milling machine across the floor before that indicator needle would move. And just so you know, I'm not messing with you. That's, that's on there. <clears throat> and I'm really surprised how far gone that last ball nut was. Only time will tell, I guess, once I've run this in a little bit more, done some work with the machine, but for now, I'm happy with how this has turned out. Some of you might be wondering, and rightly so, why I'm wasting my time with dubious quality ball screws. I wish I had an answer for that. But for reference, one single quality ball nut of this size that I needed is about two to $300. Now, I wouldn't buy that because I wouldn't want to install it on a crappy screw. So we're talking a whole ball screw assembly. An entire name brand ball screw assembly, machined to fit this setup, which is less than 20 inches long, mind you, would come out to about a grand. Now triple that for the three axes on this machine. Probably more because the x-axis is twice as long. Turns out I can put up with quite a bit of hassle for three grand. My plan, of course, 
is to spend at least two grand constantly swapping out these ball screws that fall apart, and then I'll be ready to spend three grand on the good stuff. Well, although that was a super fun $6 experiment, I'm glad it's over and my mill is up and running again. We laughed a little, cried a little, perhaps we even learned a thing or two about ball nuts. But what's really important here, you know what, I'm not gonna say. If you think you know the moral of this story, leave it in the comments. As always, I appreciate you sticking around and thanks for watching.